A journalist and uh, one of the organizers of this festival, uh, and also somebody who's been traveling to Afghanistan for most of my adult life. Um, I think there is no greater symbol of the need for friendship between Afghanistan and Pakistan and the need for unity than the common um, destruction that both countries face at the hands of extremist groups like the Taliban. But more than that, the destruction of their common heritage. Um, what Afghanistan has suffered with the destruction of the Buddhas, um, the destruction of the Kabul Museum, uh, uh, Pakistan has suffered su similar outrages in its northern areas uh, with the uh, destruction of Gandhara statues uh, by extremists and other such things. Um, today we are going to focus on the destruction of the Kabul Museum uh, and the efforts made to preserve it uh, starting in the 1990s. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully we will, we will get on to the bigger subject of how do we preserve antiquities uh, and how do we preserve our heritage as Muslims um, in, in, at a time when, when some people are, uh, want to, to destroy that heritage. Well, there's no other better person in the world today, and I'm, I'm not being facetious here, than um, just to discuss this than uh, Nancy Dupree. Um, thank you. Uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan have been a part of Nancy Hatch Dupree since the 1950s. None of, a lot of us weren't even born then. Working uh, at first for the UN in villages near Karachi and Lahore, she moved to Afghanistan in 1962 and began a new career as a historical guidebook writer for the newly established Afghan tourist organization. In 1966, she married the noted archaeologist Louis Dupree in Kabul and lived in Afghan villages near his historic prehistoric sites while continuing to write guidebooks including one to the Kabul Museum and that guidebook to the Kabul Museum was is a classic today because of course so much was destroyed and when people were putting it back together again they were actually using Nancy's guidebook to see where everything went and how to slot everything in Returning to Lahore in 1978 after the Soviets occupied Afghanistan, she wrote a guide for the Pakistan Tourism Development Corporation on Gandhara, Pakistan's heritage, while keeping an eye on looted artifacts passing through Peshawar. At the same time, she established a resource center in Peshawar containing documents focused on Afghanistan. After the documents were shifted to Kabul in 2006, this center became the Afghanistan Center at Kabul University, which now holds over 10,000 documents. She is now running that library. She's running the Kabul University Library. She's still extremely active. She's still collecting and, and guiding people uh, regarding archaeology. And um, it, it was a great thrill that uh, I introduced to you, Nancy Hatsupri. Um, along with her, um, uh, we first have the uh, Noor Agha Nuri, chief curator of the National Museum of Afghanistan. He studied in Pakistan, he worked in the Institute of Archaeology in Kabul for one year and, and joined National Museum where he's worked for five years. I was a young journalist in the 90s and I met, I didn't meet, the, these were too young, but I met their forefathers who helped hide so many of the artifacts in Kabul uh, from the Taliban, because the Taliban would just walk in and they would loot or they would destroy uh, items in the museum. And the second gentleman is uh, Abdul Hafiz Latifi. He's curator of the pre-Kushan period at the National Museum of Afghanistan since 2014. His responsibilities include research, acquisition and preservation of the Kushan collections. And he's one of the archaeologists who has expressed growing concern over plans to mine copper around the hills overlooking the ancient Buddhist city of Mesani. Now, <clears throat> just before we go any further, I would like to mention three other people who were incredibly involved in preserving the Kabul Museum in the 90s. I knew all of them extremely well. One was Carla Grisham, 
who, who has died uh, subsequently, but she did a great deal of work, an American archaeologist. The other is Joel and Leslie, who did an amazing amount of work for the United Nations, on behalf of the United Nations. And the third is Brigitte Neuerbacher, who um, uh, organized international support for trying to keep the Kabul Museum going. I will now ask Nancy to start. Um, and first, Nancy, tell us what, what actually happened. Uh, I mean, what did you go through in this period? Well, before I do that, I must say thank you for inviting us. We are very, very happy to be included in this festival, which is most important, because as we look around the world, as you mentioned, there are people who are assuming power by manipulating the dissimulation between us, the differences between us, when they should be supporting the, the, um, the characteristics that bind us together. But this is a power play, and it's mantled in an unforgiving theology and, and uh, ideology, so that is very difficult to tackle. Um, this was not so when the um, big, massive uh, looting and plundering of sites in the museum started in the last of the 80s and on into the, uh, throughout the 90s. There was no <coughs> Ill Ill uh, ideology involved, none whatsoever. The whole looting was taking place because of money, greed. And the, because the country was completely insecure. There had been a coup d'etat, then there had been the Soviet invasion, and then there had been the jihad. And the archaeologists left their, their sites and the traffickers of art objects moved in. But the important point here is they moved in <coughs> because of the covetous impulses of private collectors. The poor traffickers, they are usually blamed for everything, but they wouldn't do it if they didn't have a market. So one has to work on the private collectors who will pay millions of dollars for things. And we have to change their attitudes. Now you will say, all right, Mrs. Dupree, you're very naive and, <laughs> and that's not possible. But I can assure you that we have been working on the dealers and the individuals, and that we, uh, objects are being returned. Their attitudes are changing. And we will not be able to deal with looting and pony until we change these attitudes. The collectors that you are robbing a country of its heritage, and when you rob it of its uh, heritage, then obviously you are diminishing their sense of identity, their sense of belonging, and you can't have any development <coughs> without a sense of development. So um, this was um, happening, as I say, uh, in, uh, you, we got something up here? We got something up here, all right. One example of what uh, has taken place um, is at a ex extraordinary site up in North Afghanistan called Ay Khanum. It's on the banks of the, the, the Oxus River, and, uh, which divides the old Soviet Union from Afghanistan. 
a fantastic, huge site, kilometers long, with villas and temples, and oh, there was a theater in, um, in Aichanum that had a capacity for 5,000 people. There was also a gymnasium where they took care of the, um, of the physical as well as the mental development of the youth. It was built by Alexander the Great, wasn't it? No. Well, not really, but about that time, in the third century AD, thank you. I mean, BC, before Christ. Yet it was the easternmost um, Greek site that has ever been found, but it has many oriental characteristics. And at the, <coughs> the administration, the big courtyard with 118 marble columns, which um, had Corinthian uh, capitals, which is not entirely Greek, but it's a mixture of Greek and the Oriental, and they were, were superb. These are columns have all been taken up, and uh, they're being used by the local community in tea houses, in their own houses. It's all gone. In addition, there is, no, not yet, but in addition, you have the people digging tunnels five meters deep. And we don't know what they find or what they found. But the all I know is now nothing but a moonscape. Nancy, Nancy, give us a flavor in the 90s of the looting of the Kabul Museum by the I'm Taliban. I'm coming, I'm coming to her. Be patient, be patient. <laughs> so, but these sites, um, this is an example of what is happening. We'll never know what they found and therefore our our knowledge of that part of the history is gone, which is heritage, and it's really very sad. All right, next slide. Then. We are coming to the museum. In May 1993, there was a rocket that hit, hit the, the museum. So this was the first floor of the museum, and it fell onto the incredible Gosnevid bronzes that were just melted, beautiful things melted. Uh, but the thing is, already one year before, in December 1992, these two pieces were the first pieces that were looted from the Kobo uh, Museum. Now, they're heavy. This is schist. It's stone, and this one, um, the, the Pankara is 83 centimeters high, and the Kasyama Brothers is 58 meters. This is not somebody with light fingers. This is well organized, and it took a lot of people in order to steal these. And these were the first pieces. But after the, uh, the rocket hit them, the museum was vulnerable, and it was systematically, um, systematically looting. But there was no ideology here. They were just, and you mentioned my guidebook. Unfortunately, my guidebook was like a shopping catalog for for these dealers. And the, and, and the collectors. So when um, Sidorius Mussorius in, in, in Islamabad, who was the head of the UN at that time, he heard about this and it was fantastic. He was on the plane the next morning and he went and he negotiated a peace uh, so that the members of the 
of the uh, government, of the museum, the staff who couldn't go to the museum, which is eight kilometers outside of the city, and it was being held by dissident parties, Afghan parties. So uh, they were fighting their, their battles right on the doorstep of the museum. So we, he went up and negotiated a free passage for the museum staff to go to the museum. And therefore, we began to, to understand and to see and to record what was being lost. I'll ask Abdul Hafiz, okay? Uh, uh, Abdul Hafiz, tell us, uh, tell us what your memories are. I mean, obviously you were too young at the time of the, of the looting of the museum, but you've inherited all this. I mean, what are you doing now to restore the museum? Uh, and how are you, how you dealing with this, this terrible history? where Afghans looted Afghans, literally. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank Mr. Nancy for his thoughtful speech and uh, Mr. Ahmad Rashid for moderating this panel. Uh, and I'm delighted uh, to be here with you. Uh, as we know, uh, the impact of war on culture heritage goes by on, and uh, a distraction and lose, uh, it can break down the elements within a society that cultivate and promote cultural heritage. Uh, as a part of the cultural heritage protection, the National Museum of Afghanistan starts from the beginning uh, uh, of the new government uh, in 2001, up to now, tried to save the remaining objects. Uh, therefore, they signed many uh, projects with different organizations, uh, especially for the inventory process. Uh, actually, I'm going to uh, uh, give some more details about what we did about the inventory because the museum uh, storerooms were in a mass situation after Taliban destruction. Uh, so I have to go to that slide to show you how the museum collections uh, were at that time. Uh, here you can see a uh, uh, museum storeroom after Taliban distraction. See in how in which uh, situation uh, it was. And also another photo. So uh, as uh, Ms. Nancy Dobre mentioned before, that uh, when uh, the rocket came and uh, destroyed the building of the uh, National Museum, uh, we lost uh, some of the objects and uh, we, uh, most of the ob objects were destroyed, but also the catalog of the National Museum, uh, the inventory card of each object. So uh, since the new government from 2001, as I mentioned before, the National Museum signed many projects for the inventory of objects. What do we have inside the museum? Uh, here are some of those uh, projects uh, that, uh, that you can see it. And uh, the most important project, uh, and let me, uh, before I go uh, to the new project that we are uh, doing the inventory and packing of the uh, remaining objects at the National Museum, here I would like to thank Dr. Omar Khan Masoudi, uh, the former director of uh, the National Museum of Afghanistan and other museum staffs that they put their life in danger in order to protect the cultural heritage of Afghanistan. Uh, and without uh, his hard work and especially a teamwork of the National Museum staffs, these things uh, were impossible to do and to start from a zero point uh, to build the National Museum again and to open its galleries once again to the public. Uh, okay, physically, uh, international communities uh, came to Afghanistan uh, 
and, and build the museum and its galleries are once again open to the public and the, the most important project there in, uh, at the National Museum is uh, the inventory uh, uh, project with uh, the partnership uh, with the Oriental Institute of the Chicago University that is a, a three-year uh, project uh, that uh, founded by the U.S. government, uh, especially the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. Uh, this partnership uh, has uh, a lot of five main goals. Uh, these goals uh, are... Can we, can we move on to Nuraga? Uh, okay. To, to Nuraga. I have one very important point to make that all during this time, when uh, when uh, when the, when the uh, looting was going on, Mullah Omar, the, the the head of the Taliban, he issued ten edicts for the protect, protection of the heritage. Ten edicts. Every time we saw or we heard about a commander who was going to break something. We would get the new word down to him, and he would issue an edict. So it was only gradually, as Al-Qaeda began to take over, and the hardliners were coming up, that we came to, this, uh, to the, uh, the cabinet meeting in February 2001, which uh, introduced the ideology that they had to destroy every non-Islamic art piece. And, and what about the Bamiyan Buddhas? I mean, how was that decision taken? Yeah, that was a cabinet decision. It took all day. Half of the cabinet were softliners. They didn't want to do it. But the hardliners were there. And finally, the clincher at the end of the day said, if you don't go along with us, you're not good Muslims. And that was a kiss of death. So there were the uh, order. And I felt rather sorry for Mullah Omar because that meant that he had lost his control. The hardliners were in control and uh, the Buddhists were, were blown up. Where, where were we? Oh, yeah. Here we are. Uh, when the, the, they, they were blown up on, on, uh, in March 2001. <coughs> And the next day, the next day, the minister, the hardline minister, came in and smashed about a hundred and, but this was not a, so, this was very late that the Taliban were doing this. They smashed a hundred statues. More than a hundred and some odd bases. And this Kanishka, my boyfriend, <laughs> Kushan King uh, in the second century AD. He has been standing here for 50 years since he was found in, in northern Afghanistan, welcoming visitors. And this minister and his cohorts went in, smashed him, so he, there wasn't anything left of him bigger than your, your fist. Absolutely incredible. But here you see it restored because of there are friends who came from from Museki Bay and you never know, you never know that it had ever been broken. Sorry, Nura, <laughs> but I wanted to get that in before you. Nura, let's hear from you. Okay, first of all, good morning to everyone. Uh, I, I would like to thank you to the RLF organi organizers for inviting us uh, for such a wonderful event and giving us the, the opportunity to share the sad stories of Afghanistan culture heritage with such a wonderful audience. Uh, uh, talking about the making museums in uh, protecting the cultural heritage in stressed societies, here we would like to take um, the National Museum of Afghanistan as a case study. So uh, let me go first to explain the historical background of the museums and what happened, uh, how the museum originated, and then what, uh, how it was destroyed, and then the rebuilding process which occurred during, after 2003. 
So, you know, the museums, uh, the first museum in Afghanistan was built during the earlier uh, 20th century. In, it's in the um, uh, King uh, Amanullah Khan period in 1990. It was not uh, 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 his uh, park. And then uh, the building that we have currently, you can see here, uh, the, which is Bumabadi? Uh, you can see this one. This is the uh, building of the National Museum of Afghanistan and the objects stored here. Even the, the building is not built for the museum's uh, displays. For the museum's, uh, originally it was used by the Municipality Department of Kabul during the uh, 1920s and 30s. But in 1931 it was shifted, uh, built for the museum. Then, uh, uh, in earlier days, we didn't have too much archaeological objects uh, to display at the museum or to store at the museum, but only the ethnographic collections were there, which were, which were the uh, collection of the uh, uh, ethnographic objects of the kings, the previous king, like Amir Abdur Rahman Khan, Amanullah Khan, Habibullah Khan, and so on. Uh, but once the archaeological excavation started in Afghanistan, the legal archaeological excavation started by the Afghanistan Institute of Archaeology and some other foreign in foreigner institute like the French archaeological delegation to Afghanistan, the Americans, the British, and some, so on. So once the archaeological excavation started, the collection of the National Museums were, were um, uh, what is more than, uh, almost more than one lakh and twenty thousand objects. Uh, until 1970s. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, during the war period in 19, uh, nine, uh, from, um, from 1980s uh, onward, uh, a lot of things happened to the collection of the National Museum, and the collection was uh, transferred from the museums to other secure places. As uh, it is, it, uh, the museum building is uh, located in uh, not uh, not in a secure place. It's uh, just uh, almost at 10 kilometers from the main cities. So. Uh, the collection was shifted from here to the other places like to the presidential palace and some other places and during this transportation uh, as the transportation was not in a scientific method so mostly the object were not handled with uh, good care uh, and then reshifted to the current building and then uh, specifically uh, from 1995 till 2001 a huge destruction occurred for the uh, loss was there for the collection of the National Museum specifically when uh, in 2001 as Nancy talked about uh, this a uh, lot as the two great statues of Pamyan was destroyed and uh, another uh, almost 200 and, uh, 2500 statues from the uh, museum collection were, uh, were also destroyed during this period. So this was a great, uh, great loss for our cultural heritage, uh, but fortunately, after 2003, with the arrival of this new government, we st restarted the restoration and uh, rebuilding of the National Museum. The National Museum building is it itself uh, a historical building. You can see here, and you can see uh, during the war period, how, is, how was it? And you can see some in the photos here. Uh, you can see it's the director of the ex-director of National Museum of Afghanistan. He took uh, by himself some of the objects transporting from, from the museum building to other secure places. Uh, you can see here this, this is the transportation. And then what happened to this uh, statue of uh, Bodhisattva from Tapemrajan from one of the archaeological sites which is located in Balf province. It was also destroyed. This is also among the 2,500 objects. So you can see here, this is the conservator from the National Museum, Afghan conservator, who is doing a uh, restoration of this Buddha uh, uh, Sattva statue. And the other one is also another important is Nancy talk about the Kanishka statue. It was also rebuilt and it was uh, completely destroyed during the war period. So. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, after 2003, uh, we started the restoration of these uh, artifacts and the museum building and also we started the inventory process as Mr. Hafiz talked about this, that what happened and what we did during 2004-05 and by the uh, help of the support of the uh, different organizations, specifically like the uh, National Geographic and so on. Uh, so, um, can we can we get on to a broader subject, and that is that you know we're all witnessing the destruction of the uh, antiquities in in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, all over the Middle East right now, and um, these uh, symbols of ancient civilizations have been uh, living alongside Muslim rulers for two thousand years, 
and yet suddenly now um, we are trying, Muslims themselves are trying to destroy uh, these artifacts. Uh, I mean, Afghanistan was the first example of this and this kind of extremism. And I, I wonder if all three of you, I mean, can, can give some ideas. What can the world do? Uh, what can the Muslim world do to stop this kind of um, a, a terrible tragedy, you know, that is happening? We, we all seem helpless. The UN gives a statement, the European Union gives a statement, and, and nothing seems to be done, and nothing seems to stop uh, the destruction and looting of these artifacts. Are you quite right? And I think, you know, usually when these things happen, when the Buddhas who broke, the UN, UNESCO, all of these uh, uh, international organizations, they made statements. But what did they say in their statements? Not much more than tut tut, you know, bad boys. You got to be much more aggressive in, in stopping these things. And I don't think what we've got to do is to get it into the minds of our statesmen that this is a, a, a serious identity problem. And it's not just uh, heritage. Right? I think heritage probably has been used too much and uh, doesn't mean anything anymore. So we have to go after our statesmen to win these hangar. Don't wait six months, a year. By then it's too late. No. Uh, actually, uh, talking about what the Muslim world can do, is, is, this is the most important thing. Uh, actually, in Afghanistan, destruction of uh, the cultural heritage or the uh, uh, statues, uh, in Afghanistan, or in the Muslim, specifically I will put, uh, focus on Afghanistan, uh, and from Syria and Iraq is uh, much different because you, you see in Syria and Iraq that recently the uh, ISS uh, destroyed this uh, cultural heritage uh, just on the ideology basis. But in Afghanistan, as I itself, I'm Afghan, so I know very well our community that what's their thought about the cultural heritage. So actually, they are just destroying the cultural heritage about for the money, not for the ideal uh, ideology, uh, and they just want to get the money and to be uh, rich as soon as they can, so by, by looting or by selling these uh, objects illegally. So actually, uh, we need, uh, the Muslim world can, uh, can do that uh, to, to raise awareness among the local community. First, I think, to uh, the ownership of the people, I think this is most important that uh, we, we should focus on. I, I really think that, you know, we have to, when we see it coming, and we have to hit immediately, and we have to get it into our, our statesmen's minds to think about this, and, and not to think about politics. You cannot mix the saving of heritage with politics. It's got to be over and above. It's much more serious than politics. Uh, about the, how we can protect the cultural heritage in, in, the, in, in the Muslim societies. Uh, nowadays, uh, most of the Muslim countries are in this danger, especially their cultural heritage. But the international communities are arriving when it is destroyed, when everything is lost. Why uh, they don't have any strategies to protect the cultural heritage before uh, these extremist uh, organizations uh, are uh, destroying them. Giving the example of Syria, uh, and especially the role of the neighbor countries, are very important to help each other. Uh, give, by giving the example of Syria, uh, is there any other Arab country that before they were one Arab uh, society, but now they are divided in different countries? Why the other Arabic country uh, can't help them? Uh, and for example, uh, if they are going to shift uh, the remaining objects from uh, Syria to America, it is a long distance. But if they are shifting the remaining object 
from Syria to a neighboring country that it is uh, a little bit secure. Uh, so the lack of the cooperation between neighboring countries and especially the Islamic uh, countries uh, is not too much. So we have to build uh, an organization that uh, should work truly, not as uh, Nancy John said before, that uh, they are just speaking, they are not just uh, acting. So we have to must be an active uh, society. But the most important thing is uh, how should we uh, raise the uh, uh, public awareness and also how to change their mentality and their, uh, their mind that, okay, these idols are not against Islam. Giving the example of Buddha of Bamiyan, one of my professors once, uh, he asked me, why Taliban destroyed this, uh, uh, this statues? I said, if it, were, it was against Islam, when Islam came in Afghanistan, why they didn't destroy it on that time? Why did it destroy it uh, centuries uh, later? Thank you very much. Well, I, uh, uh, just so I, give a, I, I just want to end on a, on a slightly lighter subject. Um, let me tell you that uh, Nancy, who is, uh, mashallah, 93 years old now, uh, came, came to Kabul uh, when she was a, a, a beautiful blonde uh, American uh, student, uh, and she fell in love in 1962 with a with the most prominent American archaeologist and historian, um, Louis Dupree, who I had the great honor of knowing very well. Um, uh, he died, unfortunately, right after the Soviet uh, invasion. But um, their romance was the talk of Kabul, let me tell you. It was the talk of Kabul for decades and decades. Uh, and they had dances and balls and all sorts of things in Kabul, which you couldn't believe now that these things still happen. Nancy, tell us something of that period in Kabul. What was it like? Because we in Lahore experienced the same kind of um, things. Uh, oh, well, yes. I mean, and, um, Kabul was very, very social. Um, and there were all these beautiful people that we had receptions almost every night. And uh, there was a ski lodge, there was swimming, there was golf. All these things we don't have anymore. All we have now is concrete walls and ESCO walls. And all the razor wire which has come in since our uh, dreadful thing. And so the mentality is to be locked down. And, and I know that the, the, the security people, they want to keep their diplomats secure. And they never come out. <laughs> I met somebody the other day who had been there for three months and never been outside the compound. Now, how can you, you strategize? How can you build strategy for a country if you don't know anything about it? I mean, it's ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. And um, I travel around. I have no security. I have no armored car. I have... I mean, they come to visit my, my office, one person, three cars, armored cars, and about 10 security officers, all like this. You know? And some of them don't even get permission to come. So this is disastrous. Nothing is happening in Afghanistan because nobody knows what should be. And unfortunately, they are repeating some of their strategies. I don't think they read the Seagar reports, which told them where they went wrong. But they're repeating the same thing. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, uh, I, uh, it's I think it's very sad to hear that uh, uh, American diplomats, for example, uh, when they travel inside Kabul, inside the city, they fly from location to location by helicopter. They don't use the roads at all. So I think you know that's an example of, of, of what you're saying. Um, now, um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have the very, very great honor today of uh, presenting Nancy Hajj Dupree with the Lahore Literary Festival Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, I, think, I think it is the first time, I think it is the first time that a, a, a Pakistani organization 
has honored someone from uh, who has been working in Afghanistan. And I think there should be much more of this. I think we should honor Afghans who have been educating their girls, uh, uh, taking part in rebuilding the country. And I think this is the way that we can uh, build uh, peace and, and uh, a conclusion to this terrible conflict that exists between our two countries uh, and the, the, the refugee problems and all the other uh, things that we have been living with uh, for 35 years. I think Nancy is a prime example of um, bringing together so many elements the, the old history of Kabul, the relationship, her links with Pakistan, her links with the Pakistan Tourism Board um, and, and the books that she wrote for them, uh, her links with Afghanistan and the Afghan Tourism Board, and secondly the fact that her guidebooks today, which were once you know, glossy, um, glossy magazines and books, today are being used by archaeologists to put back together all the looted materials uh, that are scattered around the world from the Kabul Museum. So let me just very briefly read you the um, uh, citation for Nancy. Nancy is a legend in her own lifetime. Her fame and her work stretches across Pakistan, Afghanistan and Central Asia. Her guidebooks to Afghanistan where many of the monuments she once described so lovingly have been destroyed. Nevertheless, today form the most impressive resource base for Afghanistan's early history. She single-handedly put the Afghan tourist organization on the map and thousands of Western hippies used it as they came up the trail from Europe in the 1960s and 70s. Today those guidebooks are being used in an even more important role. Nancy, I don't have the award in my hand. It's being, it's being, it's being, um, uh, it's coming. It's being polished up and coming. But I want to thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Hi. Thank you very much. you really. Um, Nancy had mentioned that you need to explain to the powers that be the importance of heritage um, and in, especially in conflict zones. I don't know if that can work. For example in Lahore, what would you suggest we do to explain how the orange line is destroying and has already destroyed 16 listed buildings? How do we do that? I didn't get the question. Uh-uh. I'm sorry, it's terrible. How do we? How do we? How do we explain to our leaders not to destroy our heritage as is happening in Lahore right now? How, how do we explain to our leaders not to destroy our heritage as it is happening in Lahore right now? I know. That's, that's fair. $64,000 question. Developers, it's greed. It's money again. You, you, you can't save something because you can put a 15-story and, and get all that income. I, I don't know. We've become so, so money-oriented. We, I think, a lot of awareness raising. This is what's happening at the, at the museum. Uh, in Kabul, before it sat isolated. And it was for archaeologists and uh, not for the people. But now, these um, curators, they're going to high schools, they're going. I think we've got to get the, the idea out and, and tell the statesmen, tell your politicians, make them, motivate them, and get them talking about it. I, I, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying, and I think one of the points that you're making is that, 
that our young people don't know our own heritage, basically. People, young people don't know the heritage of Lahore. They're certainly not taught that in their schools as to what needs to be preserved and what doesn't, etc. Uh, and, and this should be part of our curriculum. This should be part of the young people's curriculum. Yeah, well, this is a, a very good point. And this is something that we're working hard with in the Ministry of Education. They have, up until now, the, the history books were awful. They were bad paper, no, no illustrates, nothing. So they're revising their history textbooks. But even that's not enough. They are considering um, supplementary reading material for schools because you're quite right. Afghans don't know their history. They, don't, they know about Kanishka. They know about the Buddha, and that's about it because it's been so badly taught. You have to start with the Ministry of Education. Actually, ooh, yes, ooh, ooh. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Do we have mic? I have a mic here. Do we have the mic? Mic, please. Okay. Um, I just wanted to address um, half his uh, in the question. He, he said uh, that we should uh, educate or speak to people about Islam and say, what they're doing is not Islamic. However, nobody addresses the question because it's not uh, okay, because we are so chummy with them, that the Saudis are behind a lot of this illiteracy that we are being forced to accept. And the destruction that is happening uh, in things has to do with their philosophy. If they can't deserve places like Mecca and Medina, who are we to say anything? What is Saudis are behind a lot of they're, they're not preserving Makkah and Medina. So how, how can we preserve these? Well, yes, I don't like to talk about other countries, but because I don't know enough to to, to criticize. But certainly uh, the Al-Qaeda, which is coming from the Middle East, uh, they don't care anything about it. They want to destroy it. This is part of their ideology. And um, I am told, I wasn't there at, when they blew up the Bahamian Buddhas, but I am told there was a lot of Arabic being told, and not very much from the Dari, right? Yeah? Right. And uh, thank you very much for the, the, the wonderful presentations that we've had today. I think it's been... Um, um, uh, very rich to be challenged uh, to be challenged with the idea of how we protect heritage and culture in the face of conflict and indeed there are parallels with how we protect the most vulnerable and those or those aspects of society with no voice however my question is a little bit more emotional away from the real import of this session is there any hope of the Bamian statues being reconstructed? Uh, restoring the Bamiya? Um, well, I hope not. <laughs> Sorry. I am on, on the side of not restoring the Bamiyan Buddhists, which uh, I think it's even those who think we should, those who think they don't. But my feeling is that the creation of these Buddha images were done from faith, great faith, belief in the greatness of the Buddha. And if you restore it, I'm sure that you cannot restrain the restorers from painting one blue and one red the way they, they were and covering it all with tinsel the way Xuanzang told us. It looked like. Uh, and then it becomes a fun park. And I believe that this, there is a, an outline of the Buddha in the cave. And I believe that is very poignant. And again, we come down to the Buddha. The people of Bamiyan, of course, think it will not attract tourists and that they will lose money 
because the tourists won't come because there's no Buddha figure. I think that this empty cave is much more poignant than a tinsel-covered re yeah. restoration. Uh, I need to say, uh, before I then had the chance to uh, answer, to say my idea about how do we explain for our leaders uh, to stop the distraction. Uh, I think we have to teach them. We have to uh, give them the lesson of the cultural heritage. If they don't, uh, if they know and destroy, so we have to find, uh, fight against them and we have to do our social activities in order to go to the street and do a protest. We don't want to destroy our... Uh, uh, please don't do this because it is part of our culture. Giving the example of giving the example of Afghanistan. If they don't hear, so go on the site and protect the site. Uh, for example, one of the American lady that she's working in Afghanistan for the use for the use of government. In one of her uh, interviews, she mentioned, "If I uh, am at the National Museum of Afghanistan and a rocket is coming and uh, destroying the building, so I will take one at least one statue or one object from the museum to protect this." So if one person protect one object, so all of us, if we are, if we have a unity, we can protect it. Uh, I, I just want to say that, you know, I, I, I've seen the Buddha many times, and I agree with Nancy that the, the, the line, the, the indentation of the Buddha statue inside the cave is actually incredibly moving. It brings tears to your eyes, and it also is a symbol of the destruction that we have caused ourselves as, as Muslims of our own heritage and the, and, and the statues that our forefathers have lived with for 2,000 years, yet we seem to be incapable of living with. And, and we should be deeply, deeply, by looking at them, we should be deeply aware of our own weaknesses and, and our mistakes and, and our fallacy. The good news is that if more money was put into archaeology, there are, there are very strong chances that there are other Buddhas lying below the soil. Um, uh, sleeping Buddhas, not standing Buddhas, but sleeping Buddhas. And there seems to be an indication that there could be sleeping Buddhas, because sleeping Buddhas have also been found in Tajikistan under the soil. And, you know, if, if there was more money for archaeology, for the museum, for you, for you young people to go out and make digs, digs and all the rest of it, Maybe we could find another Buddha which would replace the old Buddha. Well, I, yeah, you're very right, you know. Um, most of the old objects are still in the safe uh, because it's still not secure enough. But they're digging another site called Mess Hynok, and the museum is full of new objects. I mean, the soil of Afghanistan is incredibly rich. And so we have to regret what we have lost, but they uh, all have these techniques of you know, making reproductions and so on and so forth. And the, the, a lot of the uh, things are still in the bank in, in Afghanistan. They're not on display, but new stuff is. But you know, I don't know whether you heard it here, but we had two remarkable Chinese who came about a year ago. And they had developed a technique for putting the Buddha back into the, into the net with, uh, with technology. And they went up to, to Bamiyan, and they had a showing at night. All of a sudden, there was a Buddha standing in the air, and the whole valley went berserk. <laughs> because, uh, and, and they were kind enough to leave the technology with the, with the people and show them how to use it so that periodically they can have a return of the Buddha anytime. Uh, according to that, that we have to do excavation and find another Buddha for us. Uh, uh, in my opinion, as an archaeologist, first we have to secure the society uh, to preserve the culture here. They didn't go and excavate for that. If we are going and 
doing the excavation and taking out another Buddha and bringing it at the museum or elsewhere, and then we will be the wideness of the destruction of it. It is better to put it under the earth. So the earth is saving the culture head, they not me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I hope that this becomes the start of a, of, a, of a movement for peace between Afghanistan and Pakistan. We respect each other's culture, languages and peoples. And uh, this brings an end to the war in Pakistan itself and in Afghanistan. Uh, and most of all, that given that we have lived for thousands of years as neighbors of one another, um, and that this uh, conflict between us should now end and we should go back to being what we were for thousands of years, good neighbors. Thank you very much. Don't forget that culture is okay, but this money, money drives so much. And Pakistan, they can't really take any advantage of the Silk Road without going through Afghanistan. So it's uh, economically to the benefit as well as politically. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.